and I'm going to share screen. Okay. All right. So, question one it says predict. So, question one it says here. So, we're going to start here. Predict the product of this reaction. So, what are the two big functional groups you see right away? I have a halogen and an alcohol. So this is something you should write down. When you have a halogen, like a primary halogen and an alcohol, which one of, do you guys have any idea which product you're gonna form here? One, two, three, or four? Or you have no idea? A primary alkyl halide, so a carbon that's a primary carbon with the halogen plus an alcohol is going to form an ether. This oxygen is going to take the place of this bromine. So what happens here, arrow-wise, is that this alcohol is going to attack like this. This is going to be an SN2 type reaction. And this bromine is going to pop off like that. So what's going to happen then is that this bromine will come back and remove the extra protons. So essentially, you are just going to replace, you're going to attach that carbon. So carbon here is this carbon. And then how many carbons do you have that you're adding? You have three. So you have the carbon, the oxygen, and then the three carbons that you added. So one should be my correct answer. So I'll ask Mags, what's wrong with three? Why is three wrong? Because three is very similar to one. Um, the uh, oxygen is in the wrong carbon. You're, yeah, you're missing this carbon right here. So in this type of reaction, you do not lose carbons. So you should add up, I have seven carbons on this side and I have three here. So my final product should have 10 carbons in them. And if you go through, one has 10 carbons. Questions about that? Um, when you said that when you have a halogen and an alcohol mm -hmm. and it forms an ether, is that always? Yes, if you have a primary like this, this is always going to form this ether. Okay. So it's an ether is when you have that oxygen, right? That's bonded to two different carbon groups. So, okay. sorry. Uh -huh. um, what happens to the hydrogen that's with the O? like the OH, like, does that attack the bromine? Is that No, like remember it, hydrogens it, are protons. Protons never attack. H pluses will never attack. So what happens is that you have, um, here, I'm going to go to the whiteboard so you can see the mechanism. So we have this. And then we have our, my oxygen attacks and kicks this off. So then I'm gonna end up with this. So the bromine that I just kicked off is going to come back and remove the proton and get rid of it like that. Oh, okay. And then I get my final product. I and see. my side product is going to be H. Yeah. Does that make sense? Question on yeah. the mechanism. Okay. Pick the product for the following SN2 reaction. So uh, we have our alcohol and HCl. So what is our product going to be here for this one? Wouldn't it be one or three? Which one? Oh, I'm not sure. What, okay, well, the last thing I told you about was always count what? The carbons. How many carbons do you start off with? 
three. Okay, so which answer gives you that same amount of carbons? One. One, right, because three has four carbons in it. You guys have not learned how to make carbon-carbon bonds yet. That's a next test kind of question. But what I have, going back to the whiteboard, alcohol, primary alcohol, plus a uh, hydronium halide acid, so HCl, HBr kind of thing, HX, so X would be bromine or chlorine. So equal HBr or Cl. In this case, Matthew, are alcohols good leaving groups? I'm gonna say no. No, they're really bad because they're not stable in the bottom. So if you introduce an alcohol plus one of these acids, HBr or HCl, what happens is that in the first step of the reaction, the alcohol is going to grab the proton and act as a base. So then you're going to form this wonderful species that you will see a lot of in chemistry. So now this is an OH2, it's a water. So Gwen, is this a good leaving group? Yes. Yes, it's essentially water. Water is a good leaving group. OH is bad, but and I, will, and I will draw these H's a little bit clearer so you can see them like this. So you had this H and this H like this. The oxygen has the plus term. So now the chlorine can come like this and do the reaction and pop it off like that. And then you get your product like that. And then H2O would be your side product. So if you have a primary alcohol plus either HBr or HCl, you are just simply going to replace your OH with your halogen. Questions? Okay. So when I say make a flashcard, this is what your flashcards look like. You should have what type of functional groups are reacting and then have an example. So that on one side, you could have alcohol plus HX. And then on the back side, have a, a practice reaction so you can kind of do it. And this is how I make my flashcards. Um, I've tried looking for, I taught organic one time and I made flashcards for my kids for all the reactions. And I tried finding them and I can't, I'll keep looking in my files because I know I made a sheet that you can just print out that has all of them. So like all you have to do is print it and cut it and fold it and it's flashcards already made for you guys. I know I have them somewhere, I'll just keep looking for them, but this is this one. So let's go back to our practice again. Okay, so predict the product for the following reaction. We have this wonderful chain. And so now mags is S minus, is that a good base or a good nucleophile? S minus, I wanna say a good nucleophile. Yep, once you get below the second period, so when you're not dealing with oxygen, nitrogen, carbon or chlorine, uh, well, actually just nitrogen, oxygen, and carbon, you're going to have much better nucleophiles. So the further down you go, better nucleophiles or spaces. So sulfur is right below oxygen. So sulfur is a better nucleophile than oxygen, but it's a worse space than oxygen. So if you have something like sulfur, this is automatically going to be an S and Q reaction. So when I see S minus, I should immediately think S and Q reaction. So in an SN2 reaction, what do I need to find them? Um, your halogen? No. Yep. So I'm going to go back to the whiteboard so we can work on this. So you have the sodium plus, but does the sodium plus actually do anything, Matthew, in this reaction? Um, no. No. Nope. Whenever good. you have metals, they are just counter ions. They are just stabilizing the charge. Oh. So now, in a normal S and two reaction, where does your nucleophile attack? The alpha carbon. The carbon with the Halogen. With the leaving group, right? In this case, it's the halogen. So your nucleophile is going to attack here like this. 
right? And then this is going to pop off. So this is called an intra molecular SN2 because how many molecules are actually involved in it? Is it just one molecule attacking itself? So when you have just one molecule attacking itself, this is called an intramolecular SN2. What do you think the product is of any intramolecular SN2? What unique shape are you always going to form? Well, based on the answer, probably a ring. You're always going to form a ring from an intramolecular SN2. So anytime you have a nucleophile group attacking a electrophile somewhere else on the same molecule, it's an intramolecular SN2, and it is going to form a ring. So you may be saying to yourself, well, how big is my ring? Start at your nucleophile, and you simply do the following. One for my nucleophile, two for the next carbon, three for the next carbon, four for the next carbon, five for the carbon that has my leaving group. So then I'm simply going to come back in and say, all right, one, two, three, like this. So I'm going to draw my sulfur like that. Okay, so if sulfur is one, this carbon was two, three, four, and five. What else is coming off of carbon five that I have not drawn? Methyl. Methyl. That methyl group there. So coming off of carbon five is going to be a methyl group like that. Does that make sense for how to count your carbons? Yeah. Or Mags, you look a little. Um, so did why did the s uh like go after the bromine and not the na was it because of the well like, it didn't go after the bromine it's not remember a nucleophile? it's a nucleophile and remember nucleophiles always attract electrophiles right right it, as so i told matter. matthew if you didn't if you didn't catch that these metal counter ions are not involved in the reactions ever they just okay. stabilize the charges Right, so it's NaS, so it's Na plus S minus. It just helps stabilize the charges. So nucleophiles always attack your electrophilic carbons, which have leaving groups such as halogens, in this case, bromine. Okay, so, so it remember, doesn't matter that like S is like part of like the chain. Like well, it no, can still because attack it. What type of thing is this called? SN2. I gave it a this is intramolecular SN2. Oh, right. that's that's This is intramolecular. This can happen if it attacks itself. This is called intramolecular SN2. Normally, if we think about the regular SN2s, that's intramolecular SN2. But this is an, it happens within a chain. It can happen to itself. OK, thank there you. There are specific rules that you have to follow, but we're not going to get into that. So here's how you tell. We're going to go back to the problem and we're going to talk about how do you tell what's going on. I have a quick question really quick. Okay. Um, how, so when you counted the carbon, or the, when you counted the chain, how do you know not to count the methyl group as one of the carbons? Okay, so why would you? Because it's the long, I don't know, I just, I guess I'm kind of associating it with the idea of like count to get the longest chain or the highest number. That's, that's for naming, but uh, what bond are you forming? I guess I should ask, uh, Gwen. What bond are you forming in this reaction? Um, what is attaching to what? What are the atoms? A <laughs> I'm not sure, a carbon no, or- No, you just, you just saw it happen. What two atoms joined together? A sulfur and a. What's my What's my nucleophile? Sulfur, right? Yeah. What's my electrophile? Yeah. Where does my nucleophile attack? Carbon. I can't hear you. Oh, sorry. Oh, the carbon. Which carbon? Carbon five. The carbon with the bromine, right? Yeah. Yeah. That is the new bond that forms. Okay. 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 Is this, if I think about it now, can you see how my loop is forming there now? Like if I follow this like that, this is my loop forming. Okay. 
So essentially, like I said, you just start counting at your nucleophile. One, two, three, four, five. And that'll tell you how many, including your nucleophile all the way to your electrophile, how many things are in that chain, in that ring. Okay. So way too many in five. Four is a possibility, too many in three. Two is a possibility, and then too many in one. So the difference here is that this methyl group is not part of that chain and has to be taken out, so our answer should be. Okay, that makes sense. So you just have to imagine that you're forming a circle loop between your nucleophile and it. So if you can see here, if I was to draw this arrow like five, four, three, two, one, and then my loop comes like that, you see how this is kind of forming my little chain like this? So that's why those are in there and we don't include this carbon inside the, the ring. Okay, that makes more sense. Okay, next question. So now we have uh, this bi ring system um, and it, we have NACN. So, Matthew, NACN sodium cyanide um, nitrile. Is this a good nucleophile, a bad nucleophile, a weak nucleophile, a good base? Good base? Um, I'm going to say it's a good base. Okay. So what we should notice here first is that anytime you have a metal like lithium, potassium, or, or sodium, you should automatically assume that it's either going to be a strong base or a strong nucleophile. You can just make that assumption right off the bat. But CN is actually C this. And this is just a good nucleophile. If you ever see CN, sodium CN, sodium nitrile, sodium cyanide, this is always a good um, nucleophile. So we have a good nucleophile. Now we look at take a look at our carbon with our leaving group. One, what type of carbon is this? Um, an SP3. It is, but more specifically, what's the substitution? Oh, um. Methyl primary, secondary, or tertiary. Oh, it is secondary. Yeah, okay. So this is the important thing you guys need to get into your heads. When I say what type of carbon, it's, it's the primary, secondary, tertiary methyl. That is the key thing for these reactions. Okay. SP3 does matter, but you should be able to spot that right away. So this is the secondary. So. I have a good nucleophile. I have a secondary carbon with the leaving group. Mag, what kind of uh, reaction is going to happen? Uh, SN2. Yes, it's going to be an SN2. So now we have four products, right? These are all substitution reactions. Are there any of them that you can just straight out eliminate just due to common sense? I'm thinking four and three, but... You can eliminate four, yes, because that's it's on the wrong carbon, right? It's not on this carbon here. You can see that it's on a different one. So four is just right out. I would also eliminate one. Well, this is the important thing now, right? Is that we can eliminate four only because it is in the wrong place. So look for the right position, right? So in SN2 reactions, you should be adding to the same carbon as you're leaving group is, right? Mm -hmm. When do you see that? I see mild. Confusion, maybe? No, I'm just thinking. I about like I don't, I don't think you can eliminate anymore. That's just what I'm thinking in my head right now. You're not thinking what? Um, or is that your thinking face? Yeah, <laughs> I bite my pencil and I stare like ominously. Okay, yeah. So if you notice here, right, the the two carbons here in this bridge, we are two away. This is one away from the bridge carbons here, so that's why that's wrong. It's it's inserting onto the wrong place. So when we have an SN2 reaction, what happens to our stereochemistry? Do we get a 50-50 mix? Do we keep or do we flip? We get the 50-50. For SN2, you will flip. Okay, SN2 is always a flip. So which one of these should be our answer? Then? 
two. So if our leaving group is a wedge or is, uh, is a wedge, then the nuclear file would be on as a dash. Because remember, do you remember what the name is of the, the other name is for SM2 reactions? Uh, it's directional, how you attack. Oh, backside attack. Backside attack, right? So since this is coming out of the page, I have to attack coming from the page like that. So if you have an SM2 reaction, remember your stereo centers are always going to flip. Wait, I'm sorry. I feel like I zoned out when you explained this. How how did you know this was SN2? So remember, I take a look at everything <laughs> and I see what's available. So NACN, base nucleophile. Uh-huh. Asking you. The nucleophile. Okay, and is it a strong nucleophile or a weak nucleophile? A strong. Yep, because we see sodium. And if you see NACN, you should write this down. You should make a note of it. You should memorize this. NACN is always a strong nucleophile and only ever a strong nucleophile if you have not written that down. So I have a strong nucleophile. What type of carbon is my chlorine attached to? Uh, uh, secondary. Okay, it's a secondary. That means if you remember, think back to that chart I gave you, right? When I said methyl, primary, secondary, tertiary. Strong mm -hmm. nucleophile and it's a secondary. Um, since it's a strong nucleophile, it's going to be an SN2. Okay. That's going to be the oh, preferred yeah, one. SN1 is weak. Tertiary, but that's going to be a weak nucleophile. Okay. Okay. Cool. So this has to be an SN2. So this is why I said you just go through and pick out pieces. The most important thing is what type of carbon. And remember I said that your teacher is probably going to give you mostly secondary carbons. But the... NACN is a nucleophile, and that should be your clear indication that this is an SN2. So if you see NACN, Gwen, what reaction should you automatically think from here on out? SN2. SN2 all day, every day. Okay. Okay. Cool. Okay, predict the major product for the following SN1 reaction. So remember how I said if you see a metal, you're always going to assume it is a strong nucleophile? You have one exception to that rule. This is your one exception. If you have a carboxyl group, so this C double bonded O, O minus sodium, this is the only time where you have a metal that this is a weak nucleophile. This is your only example of a weak nucleophile. But if you'll notice, this is good because your professor told you this is an SN1 reaction. So what is the major product of the SN1 reaction here? Max. Um, not sure. So what is an S1 reaction? Is it a substitution or an elimination? Substitution. So what are we replacing? What are we getting rid of? The bromine. All right, so this bromine is gonna be gone. What are we gonna replace it with? Oxygen. Just oxygen or? You I'm have thinking to... OH. Nope, it's everything that is attached there. Oh, oh right, because okay. the O is going to be my weak nucleophile. But when my nucleophile comes in, is there any reason this bond is going to break? Nope. So whatever is attached to your nucleophile stays attached. So knowing that, which one's going to be our answer? Uh, one. Yep, because this is the only thing that we're attaching that has that. So this is the very common mistake that students make. They will say, oh, it's just going to be an OH. But do you see an OH here in this entire nucleophile? Don't. You just add whatever it's attached to. So going back to that question that um, we just worked on, when we had this, right? When this came and did that ring, the intramolecular one, did we break this bond here? No, it's still, it stayed attached, right? That's why we made a ring. This is true for any type of nuclear power attack. Whatever you're attacking with, attacks that nuclear. It does not break apart. You will not lose any part of it unless you're like deprotonating or something like that, but that's special case. You'll only ever lose a hydrogen from something, a proton. Questions? Okay. Now we have NAI. So NAI, uh, Matthew, good base, good nucleophile, weak base, weak nucleophile. 
Um, I think it's a good nucleophile. It is a good nucleophile, that is correct, right? Um, it can also be, it's, it's, a, it's a decent nucleophile, right? Um, but now the question becomes, which, what type of reaction is gonna happen here? So I know that I have a decent nucleophile. It may not be perfect, but I'm now gonna look at the carbon that has my leaving group. So here, what type of carbon is that, Matthew? Tertiary. It's the tertiary. So what type of reaction has a nucleophile and a tertiary carbon? Um, SN1? It's going to be SN1 because SN2 cannot happen on a tertiary carbon, but SN1 can happen. So in this SN1 reaction, and I'll go to the whiteboard just to draw it out so we have room. Gwen, are you okay there? Yeah, no, my eyes were just hurting really bad. <laughs> So we have Na plus. Remember, those metals are just there as counter ions, and then we have I minus. So, uh, Gwen, what's the first step in an SN one reaction mechanism? Um, you the I backside? No, not backside attack. That's SN two. Does mm -hmm. the iodine go and? Nope. In SN two, remember, it's a one step thing. Your nucleophile attacks the same time you're like you're leaving to lose the electrophile. In an SN1, is it a one-step process or is it a two-step process? It's a two-step. Your leaving group leaves. So this is just going to pop off in the first okay. step. Okay. So then you're going to form this wonderful deal. And what are the intermediates all that you form? Um, a carbocation. You form a carbocation in this one, right? And so now you have this carbocation. And so now your iodine is it going to attack as is? Are you going to have any type of resonance thing? What do you think? Um, I think it's just going to attack as is. Yeah. Okay. It's just going to attack. So if you have a tertiary carbon, that is the preferred state. Okay. Your carbocation will not rearrange from a tertiary carbocation. Okay. So then going back to our problem here then, back to this, which one of these answers is going to be the correct one? Number two. Dos. Si. Si want to say. Oh, God. <laughs> As my McDonald's co-workers used to tell me many years ago. <laughs> I, I now know that lechuga is Spanish for lettuce. <laughs> One of the few things yeah. I remember. <laughs> so does that make sense for this reaction, for this SN1 reaction here? Yeah, okay. I think I just, I had the steps, the steps mixed up with SN2, but yeah, that makes a lot more sense. So SN1, the leaving group is going to leave first. Yep. Okay. Okay, for our next reaction. predict the product or products from this reaction. So how many products can you form, do you think, in this reaction? One. So I think here, I'm kind of, um, no, sorry. This is really weird. Oh, no, this is just predict. There's one product here for this <laughs> one. So, um, this is an SN1 reaction again, so this is all together. Gwen, what's the first thing that's going to happen in this reaction? The bromine is going to leave or pop Like off. this, right? So then you're going to end up with this. You're going to form your intermediates. And so now, Matthew, what type of carbocation do you have? Primary, secondary, tertiary? A tertiary. Yep, I have a tertiary carbocation. In theory, I could have a hydride shift here, but do I need to? 
No, because it's already on a tertiary carbon. It doesn't need to rearrange. This is as stable as it gets. So my final product then is just going to be this here, my chlorine she just had. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Now this one is predict the product or products for the following acid one reaction, put N between numbers if necessary. So I want you guys to think about what type of reaction this is and think about what your product is going to be or products if it's two or more. All right, so Mag, any idea on this one? I think it's definitely two because since it isn't like an SN2, then it can't flip. So I don't think it's three or four. So what's going to happen? SN2 does flip it. So, but here's what happens is that remember our alcohol is going to grab this proton, right? We did one similar to this at the beginning. So then we form this. Oh. We have this OH2 now, right? And is this a good leaving group now? Oh, because OH isn't a good leaving group. So at first, yep. Leave, so this is right? going to pop off, right? Now we're going to have our carbon cation like this. God, I'm so. And so now for this case, this is probably going to give us two and three because since this is the carbon cation right now, when the water pops off, um, we can come in from the front side or the back side. Oh, because the orbital thing? Mm hmm Okay. Because remember SN1, SN1 will give you two products if there's a stereotype. Wait, so why is it two and three? Because right now, I'm going to go to the whiteboard just to share this and... So when we have this right now, and we have our leaving group like this, this can pop off. Mm -hmm. So now we're going to form a carbocation. And what is true about the carbocation? Uh, what is its geometry? What's its hybridization? SP3. Uh, SP2. Oh. So when it pops off, it is now an SP2. It was an SP3, but when this pops off, we're now missing a bond because it's a carbocation now. Mm -hmm. And so now it is a um, planar molecule. So you have an empty P orbital going behind the page and then coming out of the page. So your nucleophile now, um, which is with an I, can attack either from the backside or from the front side. So this is why in these SN1 reactions, you get two products for stereo centers. You get both of them in a 50-50 mix. Okay. You said you don't sound pleased with that answer. I get it. Like I know at least. So think I know. of it this way is that imagine I'm looking at this molecule like this. Um, and I have, I'm just gonna call these A, B and C. So these are all on the same page here. I'll call this D. I have that empty P orbital because right now it is a SP2 hybridization. I'm using one of the S and two of the P orbitals. This right here is my unused P orbital. That's that P orbital that's not involved in bonding at all. So where do electrons have to go? They have to go into orbitals. So now when my nucleophile comes in, it's free real estate. I can either come from the top side into that 
part of the orbital or I can come to the bottom side. It doesn't matter because it sticks up and down. So then now if I get a stereo center, I'm gonna get both. Okay, that makes sense. Okay, and if it doesn't, you can message me and we can discuss more later. Okay. Okay, so. Ooh, ooh, barely made any progress through this. That's right, so we're now to the mechanism part. So take a look at this mechanism problem and then I'm gonna stop here and because it's that break, I'm gonna grab myself a drink and then we'll work on this. So draw down this problem real quick for the mechanism, work on it and we'll come back. We will work on this. I um, Actually, I'm not gonna give you a hint. I was gonna give you a hint, but you don't deserve a hint. And if you do, Gwen with her wet hair. <laughs> it takes us so long to dry. I literally showered like an hour an hour ago. Okay, so think about what happened in our last reaction and that might help you. That's the hint I'll give you. So, all right, I'm going to close this out. I'll reopen it in another minute or two because I'm going to go grab a drink and then we will um, finish up this again. <laughs>